The first string matching algorithm I want to show you is called the brute force algorithm. And uh, normally this means it's a terrible solution. In this case, it's not so terrible. It's still useful. And so it's, uh, it's a fine algorithm, but it, it's worth knowing its blind spots. Before we get to that, um, it turns out that a lot of different string matching algorithms can be cast in, in, one, uh, in one framework. So let's uh, introduce that a bit. Um, most, most of these algorithms will work by making a guess. And a guess is just a position in the text where the pattern could occur. And then uh, you might check individual characters, one character from the text and one from the pattern, do they match or not? Uh, I think it's conceivable that this is what you will do in string matching in one way or another. You have to start making some comparisons somewhere and then uh, you do several checks to potentially verify a guess. Uh, the number of guesses is not absurdly big, so that's why brute force has some hope. Uh, a little thing to keep in mind, if you want to verify a specific guess, at one point or another you will have had to check all the characters of the pattern, so it needs m checks. Uh, but it might be enough to do a single check to dismiss a guess. If, for example, the text contains some symbol that does not occur in the pattern, if you find that symbol there, you know there's no, there's no occurrence, you don't need to check any of the other characters. Uh, that nicely leads us to um, a useful cost measure. So remember, uh, this will come haunt us uh, many, many times. Um, the, the word RAM model says we should just count all these primitive instructions, but we don't often feel like coding at that low level. So instead, we count something that's the same for all these possible conceivable implementations, uh, some abstract cost measure. And that's the number of character comparisons in this case, so the number of checks. And uh, if we're not doing redundant checks, now, OK, a really stupid algorithm could well do more than, than these checks. But non-redundant checks, if you, if you manage to keep note of the results, you should not do more than n times m, because that's every possible position in the text against every possible position in the pattern. You've learned everything after that, after that many checks. Nothing new under the sun after that. So how would you? How would the brute force method work? It checks all guesses. And um, the only slight bit that's uh, smarter in this is uh, to, to break out of the loop a bit early. But let's just uh, first do the example. So the text is written up here. And the pattern is ABBA. Um, so I, I already filled out these uh, diagonals to show, uh, to help me not to lose track of the lines, but also to show you that's, that's the worst that can happen. For every possible starting position, so uh, in a way this is, the starting position here is I, that's D0, 1, 2, and so on. You have to do at most four checks because that's the length of the pattern. So if we start comparing here, A matches, B matches, B matches, but then we have another A, so we have a mismatch here. So that was not a correct guess. Too bad, let's start from the beginning. So do another, oh, okay, it doesn't match. Another it doesn't match, doesn't match. So in the, all of these cases, after the first check, we could already dismiss the guess. And if you look at the code above, this is also what it does. It goes through all the guesses, and then it goes through all the positions in the pattern and compares the appropriate positions in text and pattern. And if they don't match, then you break out of this loop. So you don't continue conti uh, comparing if there's no need to. If you reach the end of the pattern that way, then you return your guess. And that was the first hit, the first occurrence. And if that doesn't happen, so if you, if you didn't get all the way to the end of the pattern, then uh, you would not return a match and continue with the next guess. Let's finish this off in the example. Uh, here we have a match, A, B, but then there's another mismatch. Mismatch, A, B, B, A. Hooray, we found our pattern. And um, let me just mark the 
mismatches as well. Um, okay, and here's the thing in nice again. I did the counting for you, so it's uh, overall 44 comparisons, character comparisons that we needed in this execution. Uh, sorry, it's 15 out of 44 character comparisons that we needed. 15 we actually did. 44 would have been the worst case, all the shaded cells. So it doesn't look like uh, brute force is doing too too badly here. Okay. Uh, I think this is still true in Java. It's essentially this method is for what they use. Um, it's only mildly embarrassing. Uh, Python is has a, uh, a much more sophisticated method. They used to have something that's fairly close to something I'll show you. And now, uh, a few years ago, they had a specific project where they asked um, algorithm engineers to come up with something better. And uh, so now they have a, a, a quite customized, sophisticated method. Um, so definitely not doing brute force. Now this sounded like brute force is not such a bad idea. And if Java does it and people are not always complaining, maybe it's fine. And it, it turns out for, for many types of texts, it works surprisingly well, especially natural language text or things that behave sufficiently random. Uh, but uh, if you look at the worst case, then uh, you can construct texts like this. So if the text is just all A's and the pattern is all A's but a single B at the end, you will always get the mismatch from the B. And so you'll have to try every single possible check. So the worst case is essentially n times m. If you do the exact counting, um, that's what you get. But in terms of the, the asymptotic cost, uh, it's the product of the lengths of the two strings. Okay. Questions about brute force so far? Okay, uh, so many of you have seen this before. Now, what do you do if your application could produce inputs like this? If both the text and the pattern are, are quite long, this is uh, potentially too costly. And it's definitely annoying for such a simple task to spend so much time. If you look at the worst case here, you could say, ah, this is, this is really peculiar and special. There's a lot of self-similarity in the text in this case, like it's all, it's re all it re A's repeated all over. So that's as repetitive as you could, could somehow get. Maybe we can take advantage of this instead of uh, being hurt by it. Uh, and also if specifically here, like, um, if you do this as a human, you don't even, it's, it's hard to, to go through and, and even write all the A's because it jumps in your face. Come on, you know there's another A coming. You've just seen, by this comparison, you've just seen that this is an A. Now you're asking again whether the text has an A at this position? Really? So you, uh, you do repetitive comparisons in the sense that you already know the outcome. The algorithm just wasn't smart enough to realize it. So to sketch out what we'll do is uh, in, well, that, that's a tough call. Uh, this weekend, Monday, I guess, at least. Uh, we'll, <clears throat> we'll look at what we can do if we study the pattern a bit up front. And it turns out even if the text is repetitive, uh, it's enough to study how the pattern behaves to exploit that. And we'll see, uh, uh, well, three to four examples, depending how you want to count uh, for, for doing that. And there's a second approach, which is a different type of application. If the text is not changing all the time, and that's the, the realm of search engines in a way, uh, then it might make sense to pre-process the text. Because then uh, you can at least hope to find matches in time independent of the size of the text. And it's quite obvious if search engines for the web would do anything that has to scan the entire web for every search, I mean, clearly not, not possible. Uh, so we'll, we'll touch on that a bit later again. 